This is Democracy Watch. So Mark, this is an episode that I've wanted to film for a long time. It is beyond clear that the Electoral College is skewed in Republicans' favor. It's always been that way. There is something called the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. So first off, can you explain what that is? Sure. So to understand the compact, you need to understand the Electoral College, which is that in our system, you vote for president by state and every state has a certain number of electoral votes. Right. So you see on election night, they tally up those electoral votes. And if someone gets to 270, they become the next president of the United States. Unless, of course, that person is Joe Biden, at which point uh, the entire Republican Party says he's not president of the United States because they're crazy. OK, so that's how the system uh, works. As you say, this is a heavily skewed system in favor of Republicans. And the reason for that is because if you tallied up instead of those electors, you tallied up the popular vote, how many people actually voted for each candidate for each of the last uh, you know, several decades of elections, the Democrat gets more votes in the popular vote. Republicans no longer even compete to win the popular vote. So some folks had this idea that what if states banded together and said, Whoever gets the most uh, popular votes, that's how our state will pledge its electors. So we, New York, rather than automatically saying, OK, whoever gets the most votes in New York, you know, Joe Biden gets the most votes in New York, we'll give those to Joe Biden. We will wait to see who gets the most votes throughout the whole country. And then we, New York, will agree that our electors will vote in accordance with the national popular vote. So it's a way to effectuate a popular vote outcome rather than an elector, a state by state electoral college vote. outcome. OK, so right now we're in the process of trying to get this compact put into effect. So how many states have enacted this agreement so far and how many will it take before it actually goes into effect? Yeah. So right now there are 16 states plus uh, the District of Columbia that have enacted it. But the key is how many electoral votes, right? Because remember, 270 wins, right, under the Electoral College. So the 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 key test here is, can you get enough states to enter into their co- this compact that they will pledge their electors and that that total pledged electors will equal 270? Once there are 270 electoral votes, or states representing 200 electoral uh, electoral votes in this compact, then you're good to go, right? Because that's the key. So, so there are right now 16 states uh, in the District of Columbia. What the key is, though, there are 205 electoral votes. So they are 65 electoral votes short of having a functioning compact. Okay, can you talk about which states are holdouts that are considering signing on to kind of fulfill that last 65? Right. So as you imagine, this has very much become a red state, blue state thing because um, Democratic states are in favor of this and Republican states are against it. Republican states are against it because, as as you and I have talked about before, Republicans don't try to win majorities. They are not a majoritarian party. So please, everyone, the next time you hear someone in the media say the country is evenly divided, change the channel. The country is not evenly divided. More people vote for Democrats than Republicans. The Senate is skewed one way uh, through one set of mechanisms, which is every state gets two senators. The Electoral College is skewed uh, a different way. But the bottom line is Republicans oppose this compact because they know that this will disadvantage them because they don't compete for a majority of the electorate. So the two states that are sort of next most likely to sign on are Michigan, which is 16 electoral votes, and Maine, which is four. So there is essentially 20 likely electoral votes represented by those two states that would be added, which would bring it to 225, which is still short of the 270. After that, then you start to get to, you know, states like Pennsylvania, Virginia, Arizona, Wisconsin, Nevada, and New Hampshire. Now, none of those are Democratic trifectas, but Nevada recently had a a Democratic trifecta. One could, uh, Virginia recently had a Democratic trifecta, although there are midterm elections now that if you're in Virginia, go vote. Uh, you know, but but those states are will need some either bipartisanship, unlikely, or would need to have Democratic control to enter the compact. And just as a quick aside, it wouldn't always necessarily be a red versus blue thing in that wouldn't big states all be in favor of this? Because then it would mean that presidential candidates would be more likely to spend time in their states since there are more votes to be won there. 
Yeah. So the best example of this, Brian, is Texas. One would assume Texas would be in favor of this, right? Because what it would mean for Texas is a lot more candidate engagement and paying attention to the issues of Texas. Because if Texas were, uh, if there was a national popular vote compact, Texas would be, you know, a huge, huge pot of, of individual votes that both candidates would have to compete for from start to finish. And you'd think that'd be the case, but of course, Republicans don't see the world that way, right? Republicans don't, even Republicans in Texas would rather disadvantage their citizenry by making the president of the United States less responsive to them rather than uh, you know, then then have uh, then the possibility that uh, Democrats win presidential elections. Yeah, well, it shows the extent to which the GOP is focused solely on perpetuating minoritarian rule. OK, so if this goes into effect because it reaches the threshold of 270 electoral college votes, uh, how does that impact the states that don't recognize the compact? Like once the, the, the compact goes into effect, does it automatically have legal force and include the election results in all 50 states? No, it doesn't. It, it doesn't change how those other states would choose their electors, but it doesn't matter because once you hit 270, the compact states that have all said we're going to pledge our electors consistent with the national vote in all 50 states plus the District of Columbia, right? Like we're going to we're going to follow that popular vote. Once 270 electors, uh, states with 270 electors agree to that, the rest of the states, how they pledge their electors won't matter because 270 is the game. OK, um, is the compact susceptible to court challenges in any way? So, first of all, what we've learned from the Trump era is that they will challenge anything. In court. Right. Everything I mean, is susceptible. Right. Everything is challenges. susceptible to court challenge. Right. You know, there's always the crack. The next Kraken lady is only is only, you know, you're only you're never more than four years away from the next Kraken lady. So, you know, the, so just don't don't take is it challengeable in court as the as the threshold. Right. I, I guess it, the question here is, is this constitutional? It is constitutional. And here's why, because the Constitution simply says that the states, the uh are to determine the manner of choosing their electors, the manner of choosing their electors. That's in the U.S. Constitution. And so we are all used to the manner of choosing the electors being the popular vote in that state, right? That's that's the that's the manner that the states have all chosen. And that's why you vote for president um, uh, at the state level. The states are free to choose the manner of selecting their electors based on the national popular vote. That's their choice. And so will there be a challenge? Yes. Will Rudy Giuliani at that point, fresh off of his latest indictment and disbarment, you know, find someone to bring to hold a press conference with the dye dripping down his face in front of the, the you know, remember those days, the, the, the. The landscaping sure. in between a porn shop and uh, uh, I can't a even remember the other place. Right, right, uh, a crematorium. Why, <laughs> right. why wouldn't I remember that? Right, right. So, will there be a legal challenge? Sure, but I think that even this Supreme Court, and that's going far, uh, would say that this is constitutional. So what would the argument be for those who do bring this up for a challenge? Like, what would be the argument against the electoral college here in court? Right. So remember, we would still have an electoral college. Right. The question is, how are the electors chosen to the Electoral College? So 270 plus would be chosen by the national vote rather than by state by state vote. So that's why I think their argument is frivolous. What would they say? I mean, I could make a fortune if I could figure out what Republican lawyers would say in court. I mean, I would I did not have dead Venezuelan leader Riggs voting machine on my bingo card in 2020. I assume yeah. who knows what the writers will come up with. Who next knows season. what the writers will come up with next? I assume that they will make some kind of federalism or separation of powers argument. I I don't know. honestly. I they they've got so many fringe theories. Um, they just are running out of lawyers who aren't currently under indictment and, and pleading guilty in some cases. By the way, it goes without saying, but if you were looking to make a fortune, there are Republicans on the other side of the aisle who've made it abundantly clear that the dollar amount has no limit when it comes to them trying to get to to lure you onto their side. I know Steve Bannon is like every day, you know, we need Mark Elias. Lou Dobbs, you know, on Fox News uh, told the told Stephen Miller to offer me five hundred million dollars to switch sides. 
I, I didn't I, I didn't turn I didn't take the 500 million. Yeah, well, well, thank God. Uh, Mark, can you speak about the implications of living in a democracy where the democratic will of the people is often undermined by a system that was put in place to prop up the political minority? Yeah, look, this is something I write about regularly on Democracy Docket, that our system of government was not perfect. It has got when it when the Constitution was passed by any stretch of the imagination. We saw steady sh- progress in making it more perfect, still not perfect. We expanded voting rights. We passed uh, the direct election of senators. We uh, made sure that uh, uh, black men could vote, then women could vote, then uh, people, uh, uh, then uh, people over the age of eighteen could vote. We passed the Voting Rights Act. We we made progress. It's still not perfect, but we made progress towards a more responsive and a more majoritarian government. And even Republicans, who I don't oftentimes say nice things about, were part of that, were part of that effort. You know, Bob Dole, former Republican senator and Republican um, presidential nominee, in the 1970s said that no one who doesn't win a majority of the popular vote should be president. So this was a bipartisan consensus towards moving here. But the Republican Party of Donald Trump, the Republican Party of of Ron DeSantis, of Mike Johnson, the Republican Party of today wants minority rule. They don't accept it as an unfortunate byproduct of an old system. That was the position of George Bush in 2000. It was an unfortunate byproduct byproduct of of an old system, one that he was happy to take advantage of and be president. Now they see a virtue in it. They are rigging the system so that a minority of the population can control a majority of the people. Look at what they are doing to try to ban abortion. They are trying to impose minority will on a majority of the population. Look what they are doing around the environment, around climate, around immigration, and around democracy itself. They are a small fringe group of people. You know, Mike Johnson, the new speaker, said, if you want to know where he stands on an issue, read the Bible. I mean, the, this is the group of people that is is opposing things like the National Popular Vote Compact because they are afraid that if everyone were allowed to vote, if everyone's vote was legally counted, they would not win elections. And so it is a very, very dangerous time in our nation's history that Mike Johnson is in the speaker's chair, that Donald Trump is the leading nominee for the Republican Party, and that there are no so-called good Republicans even standing up for them. Mike Johnson got unanimously uh, uh, elected by House Republicans. All right. Well, we'll leave it there. Obviously, on the flip side of all of this anti-democratic behavior that Mark just laid out is the work that he and his team are doing to protect democracy. So if you want to support Mark and his team, please make sure to sign up for Democracy Docket. It's the free news outlet he founded to focus on everything voting and elections. The link is right here on the screen. It's also in the post description of this video. I'm Brian Tyler Cohen. I'm Mark Elias. This is Democracy Watch.